the battleground of the present day is the fight for the, the minds and hearts of youth who are being corrupted and are having confusion cultivated. The battle for free speech in the public square and all of that, you know, that's important because it allows us to engage in this fight. But this is where this is where the rubber really meets the road and has an impact on culture. Hey, well, welcome to the Decision Point podcast. I'm your host, Mark Hobson, president of Decision Point, where our mission is to proclaim the gospel to the next generation till every student has heard. And today we're continuing our series called A Call to Courage. And today we want to talk about the courage to speak the truth out loud and in public. And to help us with that, we're so excited to have Seth Dillon, the CEO of the Babylon Bee, with us today. Now, before we bring Seth on the show and introduce him to you personally, uh, let me play for you a quick clip from his team to set the stage for our chat today. It'll, it'll never not be hilarious that it will be seen as a historic inflection point. <laughs> yeah, one of the most consequential decisions in the history of big tech that a bunch of purple-haired interns got Twitter to ban the satire site Babylon B. The 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 Babylon B. How is that not a headline for the Babylon B? You know what the Babylon B is? It's like the Christian version of the Onion. More Facebook engagements than the Onion. When did the Christians become funny? The writers at the Babylon B, who are hilariously creative. Uh, I got a lot of respect for the Babylon B because they, they they have to stay ahead of the curve on this. And that's why the the funniest parody comedy now is coming out of the Babylon, Babylon B. B. Yeah. It's the one thing you you're not allowed to touch. Mm -hmm. So what happens? The Babylon B gets kicked off of Twitter. If you said that a man could not be a woman and a woman could not be a man, you might end up like the Babylon B, and you might end up banned from Twitter. But it's just. Not funny. Awesome, guys. I'm so glad that you have three jokes. Did you start saying that people are devil worshippers or they're working for them? No, you lost me. Yeah. Even it, for satire. The Babylon Bee, in the name of satire, misgendered Admiral Rachel Levine. Twitter. Satire. Nominally, but it's still misgendering. They have scores of articles mocking AOC for being childishly dumb. But that doesn't make any sense. You know, we landed on the side of enforcing our rules okay. as written. And that's how it got bought by Elon Musk, just in case you're interested. We were, you know, banned from Twitter in March 2022. You, you restored us and a bunch of other accounts in November. And then now we're invited and we get to come here. The barbarians burst through the gate and are having a drink. You made me buy the company. Yeah. <laughs> we wanted to give you something, actually. Um, <laughs> To restore the liberty of the oh, bee yeah. Oh, yeah. was yes. very expensive, guys. <laughs> this is a gift. It's a it's an IOU worth forty four billion dollars. Thank you. Big one. <laughs> I, will, I will treasure this gift. Hey, well, Seth, welcome to the show. Great to have you on. Great to be here. Hey, for anybody who is not yet familiar with your work or maybe watched that clip and is still trying to make heads or tails of who you are and what the Babylon Bee is. Who are you and what in the world is the Babylon Bee anyway? Well, hopefully by now most people know what we are. Uh, we have been around, we, we just had our eighth birthday in March. So. Hey, happy birthday. Yeah, we're old enough for puberty blockers now, apparently. Um, I read that. <laughs> but yeah, the, the Bee is a news satire site. So we are, uh, we've been called in the media the conservative version of the onion, um, which is somewhat apt. I mean, we, we created the B to be an answer basically to the onion. You had all this comedy that was being done from a secular progressive um, pers perspective, that worldview, and nobody was really answering that from another worldview. And so that's where the B got its start back in 2016. Um, and so we just satirize what's going on in the world in the news and, and current events and culture in the church. Um, so, uh, we do video too, but most people know us for the website and the social media platforms. You know, you're eight years old. You guys are going gangbusters. It's amazing how famous you can be and still people haven't heard of you. I was asking somebody today uh, if they were familiar with you. No offense, Seth, but they hadn't. And when I pulled the Christian version of The Onion on them, they hadn't heard of The Onion either. So I guess they're equ Come equal on. opportunity. But I don't know if that goes to show you how some people can live with their head under a rock or uh, <laughs> I What's joke great is when production. people have heard of us, but not the onion. So that's even better. That's even better. 
I like that. Okay, so in uh, seven, eight years, uh, you guys have taken this company, been wildly successful. I've seen numbers like 25 million readers a month. Maybe you've blown that milestone out of the water by now. Uh, you're moving the public conversation. You testified before Congress. Was that like a year ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was last year. And you you helped in some way, shape, or form, uh, known only to the mind of the Lord, to inspire the richest man of the world to buy Twitter for a, a, a cool sum of $44 billion. Uh, so that's not a bad ride you've had. Uh, can you tell us just for a minute about your background and how you got here? And uh, especially even what was your life like when you were in high school, if you don't mind rolling back the clock for a minute for us? Well, I was a pastor's kid, so I grew up in the church. Um, and while I did attend public school early on, in the middle of a school year, we ended up moving at one point while I was middle school age. And um, and we just found it easier at that point to pull out of school and resume the year. Instead of, instead of going into a school in the middle of a year, um, my mom decided it was best just take us home and home, do some homeschooling. So we actually homeschooled for the rest of middle school and high school. And so... A homeschooled pastor's kid uh, was my was my background, and uh, and so I, I spent a lot of time, obviously, in the church and in with my youth group and doing missions trips and all of that. And so, um, when I first came across the B, and a lot of it was was evangelical Christian humor, which you know, what is what even is that? Um, we, uh, I, I, to me, it was like, these were inside jokes that I got. And I knew there were a lot of other people that were getting them too, because it was, a lot of them were going viral. And so it was, it was kind of surprising to see somebody not just making those jokes, but to see them getting the traction that they were getting. And I just thought it was awesome. It was, it was cool to see somebody doing comedy from that perspective and getting a response and actually filling some kind of void as if people were actually hungry for it. So I'll give you an example. I mean, one of the first ones I saw was about how the Holy Spirit was unable to move through the congregation because the fog machine broke. And it was this image of a very cloudy sanctuary where you could barely even make out the stage. Um, and, you know, jokes like that, it was just, it was awesome. They, they were, uh, it was refreshing to see. So I wished I had created the bee. I, I didn't. Uh, at the time, um, I had never up to that point had any experience running a media company. Uh, certainly had never been involved professionally in anything dealing with comedy or satire. Um, I, I just found it very re refreshing, and I wished that I had been the one to start it. And uh, and so I reached out to the guy that did. His name was Adam Ford, and I was really just looking to invest in it and see if I could help him get it going and uh, and, and grow it. And he really wanted to hand it off to somebody. He, was, he really felt threatened by the whole censorship regime that was um, – rearing its ugly head over at Facebook and YouTube and on Twitter uh, and was concerned about the future of the Babylon Bee and wanted to exit before he ran into those kinds of problems. And so he and I ended up working out a deal and I took it over. So that was in early 2018. So for the past six years, I've been running it, but it's been around for eight. So how did you have the, I mean, you got a lot of confidence, I can tell, and a lot of other experience, but what made you decide, I need to go ahead and buy it. And yeah, I think I can figure out how to make this thing hum even further? Well, I just didn't want to pass on the opportunity. I, I did not have a lot of confidence that I was the right person to run it because I had no idea how to monetize a media a site like that. Um, but I knew that the content was great. And I figure if the content is great, that's the crucial first thing. You know, you're never going to have a successful site if the content is terrible. And so if you have great content, then maybe the other stuff will follow. And so um, I took a chance on the, on the fact that there were just really brilliant, creative people involved. And by the way, there weren't very many of them. We had, there was Adam, the founder, and then we had Kyle, who was, who had just been submitting headlines to us. And we had just hired him basically as a part-time writer. Um, I made him editor in chief and it was basically the three of us running the show, uh, at that point. So very small team. Um, so I don't know, man, I, 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 it was a leap of faith, honestly, that, that we were, if, if we had the traffic and we had the content that we'd be able to turn it into a business. And so it was making hardly any money at all at the time. In fact, it was, it was, uh, it was not, you could hardly even qualify it as a business, but, um, but we turned it into one quickly and we found ways to generate revenue, um, and, and build up an even bigger audience. So it's been extremely successful in large part do not just to the content, but to the efforts to, sil to silence and suppress our voice. You know, all of these cancellation attempts, all of the uh, fact checks and all of the um, uh, suspensions for hateful conduct and all of that, ironically, have only amplified our voice. So the efforts to silence us have, have made us more prominent and more well-known. I would have never even been on Joe Rogan's show if it weren't for the fact that, um, you know, Twitter had suspended our account. And so... 
um, they've drawn a lot of attention to us and their effort to make us go away. Well, we're going to get into more of that part of the story in a minute, but that is amazing how that works. We we had uh, Jack Phillips, you know, the baker from Colorado, speak uh, to our high school students last summer, and he, he shared the similar thing of how people had tried to silence him for his just polite refusal to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding and said the efforts that they've done to do that gave him a platform beyond anything he ever could have imagined. I think they estimated he's done, a you know, multiple hundred primetime television interviews now and uh the irony of the of the the way that trying to silence people can actually work against you is, is pretty powerful well so that i wanted to while you're with us today we wanted to cover a couple different things because you have such an amazing uh, platform and c congrats on all your success and congrats uh two years in advance on your 10-year anniversary i know i may be the first person to tell that to you so happy 10-year birthday two years uh before it happens wanted to talk with you for a minute about the war on truth that you're seeing today um, as you look at what's going on in the world today, t can you just paint the picture as you see it of what is going on with the war on truth in our culture and even how that's playing out uh, for young people today in our public schools? Well, um, it's coming from a number of different angles. You have, when we say there's a war on, on truth or reality, reason, I mean, it's really... Um, it's really a situation, an absurd situation, which used to be kind of just uh, highlighted as this kind of exaggerated warning. It sounded very hyperbolic where, you know, you had Chesterton talking about, you know, there, we will soon come to a point where people are going to try to tell you that the, the sky isn't blue and two and two make five, um, up is down. Uh, and he wasn't wrong. I mean, that's actually what we have happening now. You, you actually have, there, there's literally people talking about how saying that two and two make four is racist or something. And it's actually, it's actually two and two could possibly equal five. And, um, and that of course men can become women and men can become pregnant and you can be a girl trapped inside a boy's body and all of these crazy things. Uh, there has been a complete rejection of objective truth of reality of placing feelings above the facts. Um, you know, the, you see it in the media, too, with the selective uh, nature in which they cover things, uh, the omission of facts, but also the twisting of facts. Um, so all of it's very Orwellian and, uh, and terrifying, and it's all done in the name of, you know, um, uh, freedom and liberation and democracy and all these things. And there's euphemisms that are thrown out there all over the place. But, uh, but it's a very tyrannical thing because really what they're trying to do is suppress true speech and replace it with lies and force you and compel you to affirm those lies. And so it's gotten, it's gotten radical to the point where I think if you just went back 20 years and tried to tell people what reality was like right now in 2024, uh, a good majority, a vast majority of them, maybe even all of them would disbelieve you. So um, that's kind of what we're up against. And um, it, it, it poses challenges for the satirist because it's hard to exaggerate a world that's beyond parody already. Uh, but it's much more concerning than that, because like you mentioned at the end of your question, you know, how does it impact kids? Well, you know, a lot of these bad ideas that we're combating with satire are being planted in the minds of children and it's being, it's being foisted on them. It's being imposed on them. And anybody who tries to push back on it and, and refute it is being silenced and suppressed. And so it's really quite a dire situation. I just, you know, I celebrate whenever, whenever I see anybody, um, whenever I see sanity prevailing and there's some kind of law or measure that's passed to prevent, you know, puberty blockers for children or something like that, you know, it's just, it's, uh, it's nice to see that there is still some sanity and there are still people who are pushing back on these things, but it's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. And you mentioned just a second ago, um, this race, uh, when you were with us in Scottsdale, you said something about a, a race to see who can plant ideas in the hearts and minds, even of the next generation. I mean, how do you see that race playing out? And, and what, uh, what role do you think young people can play in that race as well? These ideas, these, these terrible ideas, they don't win in the marketplace of ideas. They can't be rationally defended or coherently articulated, but they can be planted in the minds of children who don't have firm theological or philosophical foundations that would help them equip them to be able to ward off the bad ideas and to be able to see what's really true and what's what's real and what's good and what's beautiful and so 
um, children are very susceptible to that kind of indoctrination. And so, um, yeah, that's what I meant by that is it's a race because what, what our culture is trying to do is cultivate as much confusion in children as possible. And then once they become thoroughly confused about what's real and what's true, uh, and they start to believe things that are a lie, then they affirm them very aggressively in their confusion. And I just can't think of anything more um, depraved and and horrifying than to target children in that way, to get them to view the world in, a, in, in such a way that it, you know, it, to get them to affirm things that aren't true, that affect them very personally, and then to, and then to pressure them to go down this path, you know, where they start taking hormones that they shouldn't be taking and, um, and cutting off healthy working body parts to affirm them in the confusion they planted in their minds. You're setting children down a path for despair and destruction when you do that. And uh, I think that's what you do if you hate children and want them to suffer. And so, you know, if you love them and want them to flourish, you're going to correct them when they're wrong about who and what they are. You're not going to affirm them. Um, that's what the, that's the real job of teachers and parents is to correct and instruct their children in the way they should go. And so that's that's really the battleground of the present day is the fight for the, the minds and hearts of youth who are being corrupted and are having confusion cultivated uh, within them. Um, so I just see that as one of the, you know, the battle for free speech in the public square and all of that, you know, that's important because it allows us to engage in this fight. But this is where this is where the rubber really meets the road and has an impact on culture. Great to hear you share your heart for young people and the, the battle that you see raging. I, I'm sure you get a lot of different people having different perceptions of the work that you guys do. I'm sure it would be easy for some people uh, to characterize your work as people just sitting back taking cheap shots at people or uh, people that are just sitting back enjoying being snarky or sarcastic. And, and uh, you guys look like you're having way too much fun <laughs> for the record. Uh, but you make a, a great case for... We do have fun, and we are snarky and sarcastic quite a bit. But Man, yes, go when I was in, your question. When I was in high school, I uh, I never would have imagined you could make money by being snarky and sarcastic, because that just got me in a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> me either. I got in quite a bit of trouble at school with all that, too. Well, uh, it was nice to know it can be redeemed. So you were sharing about the, the moral case that you see for using humor to attack bad ideas. Can you share more about the role that humor can play in this war for truth today? There's a, there's a number of different ways to deal with bad ideas. Uh, I, I quote Lewis often who said that good philosophy must exist if for no other reason because bad philosophy needs to be answered. Um, and I think that's it's a great point that, you know, you need, um, you need to be able to answer bad ideas wherever they pop up and, and put them down um, because bad ideas taken seriously and, and implemented into policy and um, permeating our culture can have obviously very catastrophic consequences as we're seeing right now with this radical gender ideology infecting the minds of children and, and destroying ultimately not just their minds but their bodies. Um, you, can, you can put them down with, ridic with refutation, um, but sometimes even more effective than refutation is ridicule and sometimes it's necessary to ridicule bad ideas instead of just simply refuting them because the people who are trying to advance those ideas aren't always um, uh, open to argument and evidence. They've abandoned rationality and they've abandoned it on, abandoned it on purpose. And so it's, it's uh, I think it was Thomas Paine who said, um, you know, trying to reason with a man who's given up on reason is like trying to administer medicine to a dead person. There's no point. <laughs> but but you can ridicule his bad ideas for the benefit of others who might be potentially susceptible to those bad ideas. And um, mockery, it's, it's, I mean, it's long been known that mockery is a very effective way of doing that. It's, it's, uh, it can be deployed to, to expose foolishness for what it is so that people don't take it seriously. And uh, I think part of the reason, one of the reasons why terrible ideas are taken so seriously today is because we had very few people willing to actually stand up and make fun of them and mock them and show how foolish and stupid and silly they are. You know, instead of mocking the idea that, that men should be competing in women's sports, we, we, 
in our culture lauded that idea so much that it ended up actually happening. And now you have uh, men standing on the podium uh, winning all of these events, all of these races, all of these prizes, all of these trophies being awarded woman of the year awards while they're standing there. You know, it's a man in a dress. Um, these were jokes 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, they weren't obviously being told anymore once it became you, – you reached this point in the culture where, you know, we started taking these bad ideas seriously. And I think I think comedians were derelict in their duty for doing that. I think there needed to be more people who were willing to mock these ideas. And you saw some of it on South Park and you saw a little bit of it on Family Guy. And and every now and then someone like Bill Maher is, is willing to step in but or Dave Chappelle. But it's few and far between. And uh, when people ask me, like, who's your favorite comedian um, – Usually my answer is something like, well, whoever's willing to mock the things that are deserving of mockery right now, those are my favorite comedians because the ones who aren't are cowards. They're not – a comedian's job is to be poking holes in the popular narrative, not promoting it. And most of what you're seeing in comedy today – and I'll put that in scare quotes because it's not really true comedy – is promoting the popular narrative rather than challenging it. And so I don't think that's funny. I think what's funny is to actually challenge the really bad ideas that are mockable. And so I do think there's a moral good to that. It's not, it's not, um, it's not mockery for the purpose of just being mean or mean spirited or trying to hurt somebody. It's actually, it's mockery from a place of love because what you're trying to do is tear down a bad idea before it can destroy somebody's life. And so, um, you can try to mischaracterize it and say that this is mean or this is bullying or whatever, or it's just being, you know, snarky and taking shots from the sidelines, but there's really a point to it. And I think, um, you know, one author described satire as being, um, um, you know, it wounds, it cuts you, um, but it doesn't do it the way that, you know, a knife, if running around with a knife and just stabbing random people would do it. It's more like a surgeon who's cutting out something like a cancer that will kill the host if it's not excised. And so it's like, so satire is really like um, a, sca a surgical scalpel being used to cut out social cancers before they kill the host, which is our culture itself. And, and, uh, and I think that that's a, I think it's a great way of looking at it. You know, it's the satirist purpose, uh, the, the onion defined, um, uh, satire, um, uh, as, as being a smart ass and saying it's for a higher purpose. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know if I can say that on here, but that's there. I'm quoting them. Um, and there, that's funny because, you know, oftentimes satirists will say that, but it really is true in the sense that there is a purpose to the mockery. You know, we're going to talk just about in a minute about just the need to just speak the truth in public when everybody's speaking the lie. And as I think about students in, in public schools today, especially with, you know, with the gender ideology that is just they're just swimming in this ideology that's being pushed down people's throats all around them in ways that maybe maybe you don't even realize. I mean, my kids don't know a world that doesn't look like this moment in time, which is just still frightens me every day when I try to show them what's going on in the world and know they, they've never known a world different than this. Uh, we want to talk about in a minute about just the need to speak the truth when everybody is speaking the lie. And people will have to figure out what's the best way for them to do that in person, in their schools, in their classroom. You guys are doing it your way through your unique platform. But man, if I were in high school to know that there can be a place to just use some humor to help expose bad ideas as bad ideas out of care and concern, even for the people who are being affected by them most, I think that I think that would have been helpful to me to know. Um, and you, Seth, you guys shared some stories. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, you said people have written you in, written to you, written into you guys, sharing the impact your jokes have made on their life and their worldview. Can you share any examples of that? There's many. I mean, the probably one of the more common ones that we get is just people thanking us for keeping things light and bringing some levity to, you know, uh, dark times is somehow how they characterize it. You know, when they look out at the world, they read what's in the headlines. They see all this rampant crime. They see all this. They see all this stuff like the radical gender ideology and the and the and the crazy woke moral reasoning that's being applied to everything and this and people being pitted against each other as oppressor and oppressed and all it's all seems very dark and heavy and like and and like the moral fabric of our culture is falling apart and and so when they when they encounter some funny headlines from the bee that make them laugh at what's happening in the world there they're just grateful that that they're that someone at least is is seeing the funny side of things or at least trying to expose some of this for being silly when it really is 
Um, so uh, we get a lot of appreciation for that, but we, we do occasionally get a message from somebody who will read a headline, um, that kind of changes their perspective on things. We had one person who, who admitted to us in an email that, you know, they used to be, they used to be fine. They thought it was really inclusive and important that we be inclusive to allow, um, men who identify as women to compete against women. And, and we actually, we published a headline about how a motorcyclist identified as a bicyclist and set a world record. And, uh, and that headline went crazy viral. It was shared literally millions of times. Um, and it was for whatever reason, the way that we framed that joke and, and showed how, you know, obviously if, if someone ha is dealing with different equipment, you know, they have a motorcycle and that gives them an advantage over a bicyclist. It's not fair to have them racing each other. Of course, they're going to set world records. The way that we framed that joke brought to their attention the real issue here and that this isn't, you know, isn't, you may want to be inclusive, but what you're really doing is you're just, you're, you're disadvantaging women in their own sports. And they came around on that idea and they were like, your joke actually kind of changed my perspective on this issue. So there are specific cases where we will have told jokes and we get a response like that from somebody who says, hey, look, you know, you changed my mind on this with this joke. But I think for every one time we hear that, there's probably a bunch of times that people are experiencing that and it's just not saying it. Right, right. Well, I'm sure you get some of the other type of mail too, but uh, that, I mean, that's just got to be fun, <laughs> fun to hear, hear that too. Okay, Seth, uh, I think this episode is going to air the week before Easter, regardless of when we actually get this out to people. Easter's coming up. Uh, you guys have done mainly satire, but then I looked and saw you guys had done something totally different the other day. Uh, I don't know how long ago this video came out, maybe a year ago now, about uh, the resurrection. And you guys used humor to make an amazing case for the resurrection. I, I can't have you here without having you share a clip of that with our audience. So before we just watch a brief section of that video, is there anything you can tell us about what made your team decide to make this video uh, of Jesus and his disciples, you know, using humor to make the case for the resurrection? Well, uh, you know, there's a lot of explanations that people try to give for, um, for what really happened there, you know, for whether, you know, it, people are talking about Jesus body being stolen and that's why that wasn't in the tomb or, or, uh, or, or, you know, the disciples making things up and lying, you know, whatever, whatever it is that they're trying to do to dismiss the, I mean, they'll even go so far as to deny that Jesus even existed. Um, but, but the point of this sketch was just to mock the ridiculous idea that anybody would put themselves in this situation where they would attest to something that's literally going to get them, um, persecuted and potentially killed if they, if they continue to say that this really happened, uh, and stand by that, um, you know, they're basically leading themselves down a path that could end up resulting in their humiliation and death. Uh, and so, you know, we're just mocking the idea that anybody would voluntarily think that this was just a great idea to start this conspiracy and, <laughs> and, uh, and try to make Jesus into a legend at their own expense, even the expense of their lives. Um, and so this was kind of a clever way of us, I think, illustrating that absurdity. Okay. Well, let's take a quick look at that together here. Are we all here? I need 100% participation for this to work. Yeah. Everyone's here. All 12. Eleven. Eleven of us. Well, what's the plan? Well, as you know, Jesus is dead. <sighs> but stick with me, stick with me, okay? Stick with me. I have a plan. We are going to steal his body. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm tracking with you. What's next? And then we're going to tell the whole world that he rose from the dead. Oh. Yeah. Oh, you know I'm in. I love it already. <laughs> all right, classic, classic. Then what? And then? We're all going to get brutally murdered. Oh! Oh! Wait, wait, wait. Come again, come again. Could you go over that last part real, real quick? Oh, so what? We get murdered. What's the problem? Uh... I, I like it. <laughs> I like it. I mean, don't don't get me wrong, Pete. I love me a good hoax as much as the next guy, right? <laughs> right. Uh, uh, what's in it for us? Do we all get riches, fame, and fortune first? Right? No, no. Get this. You're going to be hated, hated, persecuted, and reviled for the rest of your life. Oh! <laughs> 
Okay, okay. So that's amazing, Seth. Uh, people can find the rest of that on your YouTube channel. Is that right? Yeah. So that's quite a video. Why does that work so well? What's what's what is it that makes that work? I mean, it's an amazing argument. It's hilarious. I don't know. Final word on that. Then I got to ask you a few final questions as we're wrapping up. Well, I don't know. It, it can be difficult to explain why a joke works. Um, I, you know, it works if it gets people laughing, and I think people resonated with that one because sometimes you know some of these things that can be they're said so seriously or they're said by scholars, and so we want to take them seriously. Um, it doesn't mean it's not ridiculous. And so if you can just find the right angle for showing that it's ridiculous, then then maybe you can get people to really see see it for what it is. So that's why I think that one's effective. Well, it's a great video. I showed it to my staff and to my kids. Everybody loved it. So great job on that. I don't know how you do another one of those, but if you can, you got my vote, do one more of those. Okay. As we're coming to the back end of our interview, Seth, I wanted to ask you about the mandate to speak the truth out loud and the impact that that can have. Uh, we can't have you here without just sharing your own story. Uh, you guys got put in Twitter jail uh, and you saw a pretty uh, unexpected impact from that. So can you tell us a little bit about that story and what you learned from that? Yeah, well, I mean, basically what happened was we had a, uh, we had a real world situation that felt like satire where USA Today had named uh, Admiral Rachel Levine as one of their picks for, for women of the year. And, um, and Rachel is, this, is a transgender health admiral in the Biden administration. Um, and, you know, we see a headline like that and it's like, okay, great. You know, this is, this seems like parody already. So what in the world are we even supposed to do with this? Our job is to exaggerate this stuff to make it funnier. And this is already like a joke. This already feels like it's straight out of like a South Park episode or something. And so, um, we, we weren't, we weren't really sure how to even make a joke about it, but we did land on a headline after some debate back and forth that we would, that we would actually change it up and just say that the Rachel Levine was our pick for man of the year. And we were deliberately, um, misgendering Rachel Levine. I personally think it's misgendering when a man refers to himself as being a woman, but that's just me. Um, so we, we, we used, we did that headline to push back on this idea that somebody who calls themselves a woman just magically is a woman and should be winning awards that are due to women. Um, so in defense of women and sanity, that was kind of the purpose of that headline. And, and we knew that it would potentially get us in trouble. We had some internal discussion about how, you know, if we put this on Twitter, we're going to get banned. Um, and we did it anyway, knowing that we possibly could. Um, and I, I, you know, an important point about that is that this is often what happens with censorship. When we think, when we talk about censorship or we think about censorship, we're normally thinking about the platforms taking down content. That's what I would call like hard censorship, where they're proactively seeking out content they don't like and, and taking it down. Um, but, but more often than that, you have this issue since you have this issue of soft censorship where people are expecting that that will happen if they say something that's provocative or that goes against the rules and the guidelines of whatever, you know, woke ideology is being enforced at the time. Um, and so people will actually, when I say soft censorship, I'm talking about people censoring themselves and, and, and re, uh, refraining from saying something that they think should be said or that they want to say because they're afraid there'll, there'll be some kind of penalty for saying it. Like, you know, a strike on their account, getting suspended, something like that. So um, we were aware that that could be uh, a potential outcome of publishing the joke, but we refused to censor ourselves and and not say it um, come what may. We were going to put the joke out there. And of course, you know, we put it out there and then the trans activists start reporting the joke as being transphobic and hateful uh, in Twitter saw their side, not ours, obviously, and, and, and took the, basically flagged it and said, um, this is hateful conduct and you need to take this down or you can't get back into your account. And so um, we faced a, a decision point there where we had to decide whether we wanted to stand by the joke and say, no, we're not deleting it. Or um, do we want to get our account back and get access to our followers again and be able to continue tweeting and sharing our, our stuff on, on, on a, one of the largest social platforms that exists? Um, those were our two choices. And Basically, they wanted us to censor ourselves and take the joke down when they could have taken it down themselves if they wanted to. Um, and we very quickly decided that we weren't going to do that, that basically the situation is one of the reasons they have so much power is because people are willing to just continually play by these stupid rules where they, they uh, control what you're allowed to say and think. And so many people are willing to go along with that, that it actually works. And at some point, somebody needs to say, no, I'm not going to go along with that. 
I don't want to be on a platform that has rules like that, that require me to, um, to, to censor my own jokes. This is just a joke. And by the way, it happens to be rooted in the truth. This person actually is a man. So, um, we felt very strongly that it was important that we not delete the joke. And we knew that there was going to be a cost to, to refusing to delete it. But that if, that if somebody doesn't eventually say, I'm not playing by these rules anymore, nothing's ever going to change. In fact, it may only get worse. And we were hopeful that other people would, you know, see the point that we were trying to make and that they would follow along and also um, start to speak the truth more boldly and refuse to censor themselves and so on. So um, that, that was our hope anyway. But even if that didn't happen, we, w- we could at least sleep at night knowing that we did the right thing. Um, so we refused and publicly said so that we weren't going to delete the joke. And of course, you know, what ended up happening from there is this caught the attention of Elon Musk. And he was he noticed that we had been suspended and and ended up reaching out to us to confirm that. Um, and mused on that call that he might just need to buy Twitter um, as a result of, you know, comedy being made illegal. And, and that was something that really bothered him. Um, yeah, and, why, so, and, by, and for the record, why didn't you decide just to buy Twitter yourself? I mean, what, what, <laughs> what kept you from doing that one? I mean, you bought well, we the might Babylon Bee. <laughs> we might need a few more subscribers to be able to pull that off. Um, $44 billion is a pretty hefty price tag. So it's um, a lot of money. It is a lot of money. It's hard to even fathom that amount of money. It's hard for me to, to conceive of even a billion dollars, much less $44 billion. Um, so, you know, what Musk did there was really interesting because he was already kind of positioning himself to take over Twitter. Um, he had already been buying up stock. He had already been looking at trying to get on the board. Um, and, you know, he really sees very clearly this threat to free speech. Uh, it's not that he's just it's not that he's just aligned with conservatives and believes everything that conservatives believe. He just thinks it's wrong that they're being silenced and that you're not allowed to say true things on these platforms. Um, he finds that to be a huge, huge threat, a huge problem. And he's right. And he was willing to pay a price to try to fix that problem. And so we, we owe him a huge debt of gratitude. We, we, when we interviewed him in May of last year, we handed him an IOU for $44 billion, which, you know, uh, I believe that was shown in the in the intro video at the at the start of this. Um, yeah, I hope and, he never uh, calls to collect on that. Yeah, I hope I hope not. We didn't sign it, so maybe we're off the hook on that. Um, <laughs> Have him hit but, Kyle up, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it was just monumental. What he did was monumental, and uh, that we had a small part in the the you know the wheels turning to get all of that in motion. Uh, even if it was just the straw that broke the camel's back and 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 made him feel the need to to pull the trigger and, and buy Twitter. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing and it's, and it's, and it's unfortunate that we have to depend on like a benevolent billionaire to, to, to solve this problem for us. There's the law hasn't caught up yet to the fact that there's private platforms that are controlling speech right now. Um, there's no rule, there's no law to protect us from them and their, and their censorship. So, um, we'll have to see what happens with that, but, um, thank God for Elon Musk and, uh, and his in his commitment to freedom, I think one of the, the key lessons that Elon taught us in this whole thing, especially with the advertisers now, uh, since he took over Twitter, pulling all of their ad spend, you know, Disney and IBM and all these big brands saying, if you don't censor more people, we're not going to spend hundreds of millions with you like we used to. And he's telling them, I don't care. Take your money. You, you can't control me with money. I'm not going to I'm not going to the people I just freed and just, you know, just took their shackles off. I'm not going to lock them back up again because you're holding money over my head. I'm willing to pay a price to keep them free. And that was really refreshing to see him do that. It was really bold. I wish more people would do it. Uh, maybe he will embolden more people to do it. I think that I think that that's the only way this changes is if people are willing to stand up, speak the truth boldly, refuse to censor themselves. Courage is contagious and it will spread if they're willing to do that. Yeah, I like how he said at that interview with uh, the CEO of Disney in the room, um, I think it said something to the effect of there's a weakness to want to be liked by people and I don't have that weakness <laughs> and you can <laughs> you can tell that he uh, he doesn't and more more people need to not have that weakness they also want their businesses to be profitable which you can't fault them yeah. for that I want my business to be profitable in fact I need it to be profitable um, but you know he's in a very unique position where uh, where he can where he can actually take on huge financial burdens and and weather that that storm in a way that most people can't and his willingness to actually do that at great expense not just to himself financially but also you know his reputation and everything with them calling him a 
uh, far right extremists now and all of that nonsense. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty incredible. So when you were with us in Arizona this past fall, you mentioned a study uh, of the impact of one person speaking the truth when everybody around is speaking the lie. Can you share that with us? I think it's a, a powerful lesson for young people today. Yeah, the stu- the, what I was referencing there was the, um, the a social conformity study that was done back in the 1950s called the Ash Experiments. Um, I believe Ash was, uh, that's the last name of one of the scientists that was involved in, in putting on the study. Uh, and the, the, what basically the purpose of this study was to determine um, to what extent social pressure uh, um, affects people and, the, and what they're willing to say. Um, and, and the way that they basically put the, the, the program together was they would have a subject uh, who they were evaluating. Um, and the subject would think that everyone else was just involved in a, in a regular, you know, study, but, but everyone else was actually in on it. So, so they were the only person that wasn't, and they didn't know that. Um, and what they did was they, they basically, they gave everybody two cards that and one, one card had three different length lines on it, you know, a short line, a medium length line, and then a much longer line. And they were like labeled A, B, and C or something. And then a reference card that had a matching line on it, just one line that matched one of the three in the other card. And so they, they made everybody go around and, and say, you know, which line it matched to, A, B, or C. And, um, and they instructed everybody who was involved to, to give the wrong answer. Um, and so they, you'd have like eight or nine or ten people give the wrong answer before it got around to the subject. And, and they're sitting there <laughs> thinking they're crazy because they're like, wait a minute. Why is everybody giving the wrong answer? They're probably questioning their own sanity when they're looking at these cards and thinking it's clearly, you know, A, and everyone just said B. What am I going to do? And in this, in this study, what, the fascinating thing was that most people, um, in some cases up to 75% of the time, people said the wrong answer just to match everybody else and conform to everybody else and not be seen as an outlier. They felt more safe if they were just saying what was not true in order to just get along with everybody else and not be seen as, as somebody who is counter to what everyone, they may have even been questioning their own sanity when everybody else was saying the wrong thing. And so they, they may have thought maybe they were wrong about which, which line matched, um, uh, didn't even trust their own eyes or judgment. Um, and so that was very interesting to see that high of rate of people. You know, you'd think that if you were in that situation, you would say, nope, you're all wrong. It's actually a, um, but most people didn't do that. And then the, I think the really interesting part, the really crucial part of the study was when, was when they introduced a variable where they had one of the people at the table, you know, actually say the right answer. And so there would be many, several wrong answers, but one person who gave a right answer. And then it would come around to the subject again. And just the, the presence of one person at the table giving the right answer seemed to really give permission to the subject of the study that they could also give the right answer. And the conformity rate dropped to 5% or below. So... Um, very few people were willing to go along with the lie once they saw that someone else was willing to say what was true. And I think that that's just a powerful illustration of the fact that you don't need to have a tremendous amount of power or influence or money or whatever. You don't need to be Elon Musk. You don't need to be the CEO of the Babylon Bee. You can just be sitting at a table with a bunch of people who are saying two and two makes five, and you just have to be the person who says, no, it makes four. Two plus two is four. Men can't get pregnant. Um, drag shows for kids is immoral. Um, you know, just be willing to say these things that no one else is willing to say, uh, refuse to conform just for the sake of conformity, just so that, you know, just refuse to, to, to be afraid of being an outlier and you will give other people permission. You will embolden other people to also say what's true. And then the next thing you know, there might actually be several people at the table willing to say what's true. And that will change the culture dramatically. So I think it's a, it's a powerful illustration of the impact that just one person can have on the environment around them. Yeah. And, and the impact, like I love how you said it, just even anybody in any situation can have, because it'd be easy for somebody to look at you or Elon or anybody and say, well, I'm not him. I don't have 44 billion sitting around or I don't have whatever, but just anybody, any situation speaking the truth and everybody's speaking the lie. Seth, you've been uh, very generous with your time. I've just got one uh, final question for you. We've talked at the beginning about the challenge that's before us. Uh, we, we've talked throughout about the problems that are all around us. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. What hope do you see before us? And even what, uh, what unique opportunity do you believe that young people have as they're leading for the Lord in this moment? 
I've become somewhat cynical as I've gotten older about other people and their motives, but I haven't lost hope. Uh, I do still have hope that there is a bright future, that a lot of these lies will in fact be put down uh, and that they won't prevail, prevail, that madness won't prevail, that in fact sanity will. Um, I do hold out hope for that. And I think I see we see a lot of shift right now and reason to believe that there will be this kind of maybe pendulum swing back in the direction of sanity. You do see a lot of people waking up from woke, as Elon puts it. Um, I'm not sure if he originated that or if he, or if he got it from someone else, but there are people waking up from woke. Uh, they're seeing that this woke moral reasoning is not in fact um, sound or tenable or, or good. Um, you know, the idea that if you're oppressed, anything goes, you can just do anything and that you're in the right just because you're oppressed and marginalized. Most of the people who are even being described as oppressed and marginalized aren't actually oppressed or marginalized. They're actually the most privileged people on the planet. Um, but I think, yeah, people are starting to see that they're starting to see it for what it is. And so maybe there's some, some hope there that we will, that we will swing the pendulum back the other way. I also think that when people are deprived of truth and goodness and beauty, they start to crave it and, and that there's, there's something, you know, because we're made in the image of God and we're a reflection of him, you know, we have, we have inside us ingrained in us uh, an understanding of what is good and what is true and what, what is beautiful. It's built into us. It's baked into us. And to, to take that away from us, um, you know, there's, a, I, I can't sketch it out in a lot of detail, but there's a very powerful scene in, in Lewis's uh, that hideous strength. Um, where they're trying, basically, the, the NICE is this evil organization that's trying to basically brainwash one of the main characters into, into um, seeing the grotesque and the distorted and the twisted as being normal and good and acceptable. And, and they do that with a lot of imagery, and there's, there's, they, they basically place him in these different rooms where he's, uh, where he's encountering imagery that's, that's just bizarre and weird, and, and, uh, and they're, and they're, and they're doing all these psychological tricks to try to get him to go along with whatever whatever conditioning they're 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 putting on him, um, and it ends up having the opposite effect where where he be, kind of becomes more uh, awake to and aware of the fact that there is in fact objective good and truth, and that it can't be suppressed and it shouldn't be suppressed. They and so I, one of the ways that Lewis put it is like you know like a man in a desert who's starving for or who's who's thirsting for water. You know, he realized his thirst for for the truth and goodness and beauty. Um, I think that that's I think that that's the situation that we find a lot of people that a lot of people are finding themselves in right now is that they're they're hungry for the truth, and and they're largely noticing that hunger because they're being deprived of it for the first time. You know, they're 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 losing sight of it, and it's making them hungry for it again. So, I am hopeful. I am hopeful, um, and obviously God is in control. So we need to continue to place our trust in Him. And trust that you know that he knows where things are heading, and that he has plans for us that will um, that will overcome these these forces that are trying to get us to deny the good and the true. Well, Seth, thanks for your time. You've been more than generous with uh, your time, your insights, and your encouragement for young people today. It's been great having you on the program. Thanks, appreciate it. Great to be here. Well, friends, hope you enjoyed that chat with Seth Dillon, CEO of the Babylon Bee, as much as I did. Uh, sure, he sure has a lot uh, to share with us. So make sure to share this episode with a friend. I think you'll have a lot of people to be interested in hearing uh, from him and the great uh, insights that he shared with us today. Hey, listen, we're going to take a quick break uh, from the show for one week uh, as we're going into Easter this weekend. So happy Good Friday and happy Easter uh, to all of you. We'll be back week after next, and that'll give you a chance just to enjoy the holidays and also on the off chance that you have missed any episode in the series, uh, then you can go back and watch that or, or probably more like likely rewatch all of them. I know that's what you want to do in the next week. Uh, and then we'll be back week after next. And you're not going to want to miss that. We're going to be joined by Jack Phillips uh, from Denver, Colorado. Uh, Jack is the baker who about 10 years ago uh, politely declined to bake a cake for a quote unquote same sex wedding. And 10 years later, his legal challenges have not stopped. Uh, even though he won all the way at the Supreme Court. Jack is a dear man of God uh, with a passionate love for Christ, passionate love for everybody, 
including and especially the people who have caused him all of this trouble. And Jack has a powerful message for us as we will continue in our series, A Call to Courage. So we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, we'll see you then.